Hello to all my people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Pods and Share Shots. I'm your host, a chef by trade, no mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and someone joining me tonight, you've seen him earn gold everywhere he's been. He is a former X Division champion. He is Robert Raju. Robert, thanks for coming on. Chat about some wrestling, brother. How are you? It is the jaw jack and back crack and God created all men equal that he made me the sequel, the mocha skin manimal himself, Rohit Raju. Rohit Raju. Yeah. D don't worry, man. Everyone, no one gets the name right. Commentary half the time, wherever I'm at, is brutal. <laughs> and see, this is the thing. I, uh, I, I try to be as... And the integrity of the journalism side. I pride myself on that. I actually went to school for it at one point. So I, I went back and tried to watch as many videos as I could. And it and honestly, since you said it, I watched like three different interviews and it seemed like every single person said it differently. And I was like, yes. just roll the dice with it then. <laughs> so I, The Rajan part's easy. It's like usually Rohit. And then people will always say either Rohit or they see it's weird. It's like this weird effect to where they see the R A and Raju, so they'll instantly say Rahit or Rahit Raju. So instead of like an O and an A, Rohit and Raju, they just do two A's. And I always tell people like, just think of the heat, and then Ro and then Heat. Or when I was like on Ethan Page's vlog, it was Ro Meat. So I was, you know, but yeah, people always mess it up all the time. Well, uh, I appreciate the leniency there. So uh, let's let's dive right into it. I was saying I kind of start these always the same way. And uh, I call it the origin story of where we came from. For me, I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s, saw the very tail end of the NWA, watched WCW come in. What do you remember watching as a young wrestling fan? What were you exposed to? The exact same stuff, man. Uh, when I, I think and – and, and my first memory was – and I always – it, I'm, it might not even be my first real memory, but what I can remember was my dad was flicking through channels and there was, they were showing highlights of old road warriors match. And it was a road warriors versus the Koloffs in a Russian chain match. And I was like, what is this? And then I discovered Hulk Hogan, Hulkamania, Macho Man, Randy Savage, stuff like that. And then of course, you know, NWA, uh, back when it was the four horsemen Sting, dusty Rhodes, Dusty Rhodes, dead it, stuff like that. And I was just hooked. I was hooked and I've never not been a fan of wrestling. And what made me think like, oh, maybe I can do this was late nineties when the cruiserweights, when I started seeing Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, Rey Mysterio, all the luchadors, guys like that, Jerry Lynn, and then ECW. And I was like, man, these guys aren't that much bigger than me. Maybe this is something I could do. And then I just kind of, you know, I ended up finding a place to train years later, and the rest is history. So, as a fan, you eventually had to have that conversation with yourself where you were like, okay, this is what I want to do. I'm going to be a pro wrestler. I want to do it. Um, how did you go about training and figuring out where you want to go to school or how you got into a training program? What was that process like? Well, when I got out of high school, the only one that I could find, it was funny because the internet was still... It, it was not, I don't want to say it was kind of new, but it was still, it wasn't like as crazy as it is now where you could just type in Google and there it was. So I would, I would search things like that, but nothing would ever come up because pro wrestling, it was popular. And the only one you really knew of was the WCW power plant. And I, that was in Atlanta. That was too far away from me. I was in Michigan. The closest thing was Al Snow's gym in Lima, Ohio. And I think I caught it at the tail end, but I had just started working and I couldn't afford it. There was no way. I didn't even have a car at the time. I was just out of high school. I don't even think I was out of high school yet, but I was looking because that's what I wanted to do was be a pro wrestler. And we would always sneak up in the mezzanine at high school and we'd like, you know, try moves on each other. And I was always enamored with the promos and the characters. So we'd skip school and get tickets to like Raw or Nitro to get like, you know, try and get like floor seats. And then after the show, the wrestlers, we would go to the back where the wrestlers would go out to their cars and I would be cutting promos on the wrestlers as they would walk out. I'd be imitating Dusty Rhodes or I'd be doing Macho Man. Yeah, I'd be doing all these imitations where I would be cutting them on fans. And then we, you know, a, a, a core of us started doing like the backyard stuff. Uh, and then a guy that we knew, he was our ref, he found someone in the area and he ended up getting trained. And I was like, man, is this the legit? And I knew Monty. 
from just Monty Brown from working and he was, we we're both grew up in the same city and Monty was a wrestler at the time and he kind of blew up. And there was another guy by the name of Alcatraz who was good friends with him, who was also a wrestler. And I would ask them, Hey, is this guy, Joe bird, Savior justice, is he legit? And they're like, yeah, he's a good guy to start off with. So I started going there because he was about an hour away. So on my days off from work, I would train there. And then I was, when I was cleared, I would go down to the House of Truth, Truth Martini School down in Detroit, and I would start, you know, picking his brain a little bit. And then I would start doing all these seminars of other wrestlers, doing the Ring of Honor camps. And then years later, I think I was maybe eight or nine years in, there was a group of us started going up to the Can-Am Dojo, Border City, Scott DeMore's place. This was before he even got back with Impact. Uh, and then we just started going out there, Johnny Bravo, Johnny Devine, Phil Atlas, um, A1. There's a lot of guys out there bowling. And we would just also learn new stuff from them and roll around and just tighten up our game. So that was pretty much my history as far as how I got into it when I started training and stuff like that. It wasn't easy. Um, but, man, I remember the first time I took a bump, I had a headache, neck ache, back ache for days. And I was like, oof. I don't know if I can do this, hitting ropes for the first time and taking moves for the first time. And then after a while, you just like anything else, you repetition, you get your body gets conditioned and you just start, you know, going as much as you can and doing it as much as you can. And you start picking things up a hell of a lot easier and you end up finding that, hey, I'm pretty good at this. I'm going to stick with it. So in other sports, you hear people reference the term student of the game. In football, guys, a quarterback can go from coach to coach and absorb what he can from each coach. In wrestling, is it possible for a wrestler to be a student of the game? You just talked about going from various places and you know being a sponge and training with different people. Do you think in wrestling it's just the same as other sports where a person can be a student of the game and just constantly be a sponge and absorb as much as they can? I, I believe so. I felt like I was with the people that I was training with. I felt like I was picking things up quicker than they were. And then even when I'd go to seminars, just in that comes from a sports background and just having a passion for something. I used to do Wing Chun Kung Fu for like 10 years. And that was the first martial arts that Bruce Lee started in. So I was trying to find something that Bruce Lee did. And there was no week or um, there was no Jeet Kune Do around here. So I was like, man, I'm going to do this. And I just soaked up everything that was taught. When I was big into basketball, I was big into basketball during like the Jordan era. And I would, I used to know everybody's stats and stuff like that. And I just soaked up basketball and uh, same thing with weight, weightlifting and powerlifting, anything that I was passionate about. So I think any, if you're passionate and you have the proper tools, I was athletic, um, charismatic, and I was a, a fan of wrestling for years. So learning the movements of stuff didn't come too hard. You know, there's always a few things that you might not pick up, but I see it in other people that may have been wrestling way less than you, but their experience level and who they've been in the ring with and how many good quality matches they've had uh, speaks volumes and they pick up on things quicker. So hands down, through the game, any sport in, in professional wrestling is no different. Looking at when you broke in the business and then you look at the way guys are breaking in in 2023, looking back five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, what's the biggest difference you see from when you broke in versus how guys are doing it now? There's a few differences. I'd have to say mental toughness. I think that's a thing in society nowadays. There, there, now, don't get me wrong. There was definitely some bullies but I do believe in like a tough love, like hard training. When I used to play sports, I'd get yelled at all the time by my coach, especially if I messed up. Uh, same thing in martial arts. If I'm losing these fights, why am I losing them? My coach isn't going to baby me. My, you know, my trainer isn't going to baby me. They would, they would tell me like, hey, you got to get your head out of your ass. This is what you're doing wrong. And pro wrestling was no different. I think nowadays it's, it's just kind of how society is like, well, everybody can be a professional wrestler. No, everybody can't be a professional wrestler. And that's what makes professional wrestling and high level sports special because not anyone can do it. I also think the internet is a huge tool. You can have a good highlight reel. And next thing you know, you're wrestling on a huge promotion because you all of a sudden build up this huge fan base. You have a bunch of people jumping on your bandwagon and now you're the uh, best wrestler in the world. And that, that, that title, best wrestler in the world, seems to change every single week when someone has like a banger of a match. 
And next thing you know, oh, they're the greatest wrestler of all time. And then a week later, you see them have just some basic match, and it's not. And I I think a lot of people, and, and this gets, you know, I mean, people can take this how they want. I don't think professional wrestling is as good as it was. And that's not saying it's bad. I think a lot of the little things get left out and people's tastes have changed to where they're not as critical. It's the same things with movies and music. Things are very formulaic nowadays. So subpar entertainment and and matches and stuff like that, it gets a pass. Look at old school basketball compared to now. Back when like the Detroit Bad Boys were around, man, it was harder to get to the hole. You were getting beat up. Nowadays, guys just flop, barely get touched. It's a foul. It's different. It's I don't want to say softer because that's a very I think that's a disrespectful way of putting it because the guys out there wrestling are just as tough as anybody that they were back in the day. But I do think I don't think guys are as good. I mean, look at like the era of, I guess you could say like the attitude era. Steve Austin, we still talk about Steve Austin to this day. The Rock is one of the, the biggest personalities in all of entertainment. There's reasons for that. And I think that is missing. Roman Reigns, I think, is a guy that is the last of that era. And I think John Cena was before Roman went heel. There's guys that are larger than they, they, they're, they go outside the box. If you don't watch professional wrestling, you probably know, you might know who Roman Reigns is. You know who The Rock is. You know who Hulk Hogan is. You know who Steve Austin is. You know who John Cena is. It's because they transcend professional wrestling. There's no one that can cut those promos like that, or there's not a lot of guys that can. There's not a lot of guys that can create moments. There's a good chunk of guys that can have fantastic matches, which is awesome, and it's that has its place in professional wrestling and it, it, it should guys should want to push that bar and be like your your kenny omegas your daniel bryans you know they should want to be like that but you should also want to be like like i'm a big fan of mjf because he has that entertainment side and there's so many guys that just think having five star matches are is going to carry you to being you know memorable but a lot of times those matches get forgotten about a week later because there's another great match it's the moments. It's when the Usos super kicked Roman Reigns. That's a moment. It's when Daniel Bryan took that jumper off and turned on Bray Wyatt. That's a moment. Those are things that get talked about forever. And that is missing in professional wrestling. So, and that all, and it's kind of a long winded answer. So I, you know, I apologize, but no that goes, here. that's, that's missing in my opinion. The internet makes things easier. And there's a lot of guys who I think are really good that aren't getting signed, who can wrestle better than the guys that are getting six figures on TV right now. And it's because they have no clout. They're not as popular and they don't have that thing that garners that, that internet attraction. Dan Housen is a master of the internet. Um, I look at him. He's memorable. He doesn't have to go out there and have a five-star match, but you remember, whoa, you know what I mean? Or the like, you have people that are personalities uh, and actors and or other wrestlers wearing his merchandise. It's not because he's putting on five-star matches. He, he could if he wanted to. He doesn't need to. He's creating moments, and those moments are – you'll remember that. You'll remember him way long after he's retired, and he's used his, char his character, but he's also used the power of the internet – to become this larger than life professional wrestler who transcends professional wrestling. And I think that's missing nowadays. And all that stuff that I rambled on about is a big difference compared to back in the day. I'm going to ask this question and it's, it's, it might be a loaded question, but it's kind of based off of what you were just, what you were just talking about. You compare yeah. kind of the NBA now versus then talking about wrestling now versus then some people say it's hard to compare a LeBron James to a Bill Russell because the sport has evolved so much. They're like, mm -hmm. LeBron's not playing the same NBA basketball that Bill Russell is playing. Do you think you can apply that to wrestling, though? Could you look at wrestling today and say Roman Reigns isn't wrestling the same style of sport or business that, say, a Bruno was wrestling in the 70s? Yeah, and that's all because the sport evolves. 
And but one thing that is tried and true to this day, and you can look at any era of professional wrestling, and it is the entertainment part. Now a lot of people got mad at Vince McMahon when he was like, "It's sports entertainment, pal." You know, they got mad at that, but it is sports entertainment because you had that entertainment factor. Uh, Undertaker, one of the best in the game. He doesn't wrestle like Kenny Omega. He doesn't need to because the Undertaker does what the Undertaker does so well. Gorgeous George would still fly today because he was so entertaining. It have to be tweaked for today's audience, but that type of wrestling still flies. Now, the catch is catch can, Bruno San Martino. No, that's evolved into more of a um, uh, Brian Danielson thing or a, a Zack Sabre Jr., style of professional wrestling to where it's it's tweaked more to where it's more entertaining it's more fast-paced but it's still that um greco-roman style you know what i'm saying but it's the the swagger of kenny omega coming out doing the point walking out to the final fantasy theme with the sephiroth outfit on it's that part you know it's the way kenny moves in the ring with speed and intensity same thing with naito naito is a great wrestler but it's his that Eddie Guerrero style swag and attitude that never goes away in professional wrestling. Roman as a heel to me is one of the best in the game right now. Randy Orton, people would give crap to Randy Orton all the time when he'd say, you don't need, I don't need to do all these dives. He doesn't because Randy can get the crowd going just by pounding his fists on the mat because he's, he has conditioned you so well to know that when he's about to do that, it's something special is going to happen. And I think that is from Bruno's era to now. And I, and that's one of the things I think is missing. I think I'm trying to think who's a great wrestler right now that can combine those two. Oh, I'm trying to think, I think AJ styles comes to mind when it, it is the athleticism of putting on fantastic matches, like work rate style matches, but also can be entertaining as hell. Um, John Cena is a perfect example of the era of professional wrestling, which I'm talking about. Cena was never, you know, he never wrestled like, um, like a Zack Sabre Jr. or, you know, like That's a Dean Malenko. For I mean, me. was Zach right. Sabre you know Jr. what I mean? Yeah. But, but, but Cena's, no matter what he did, you were always invested. You were invested because you either wanted to see him fail or you were invested because you wanted to see him w win. But his promos always would drag people in. And there was one promo in particular, and I can't remember what it was, but it was on Raw. And you had at least 70%, 80% of these people booing him out of the building. He cut such a passionate promo. By the, the time he was done, you had 40 or 50% booing him instead of that 70 to 80. Because he turned them just with his words and his passion that to me is pro wrestling, creating those moments. But if you can mix that and the style of like a Kenny Omega or something like that, to me, you've you've hit like what today's professional wrestling should be. That's just my opinion. Obviously, when you tell someone your opinion on what professional wrestling should be nowadays, it's you know, especially if it's on Twitter, it's like you know, absolutely toxic. But I I believe if you capture that era of entertainment that never goes away with today's style of professional wrestling you're you're you got it you got it made and that's what i try to do I, and i'm not like the most over person I, I think i'll be one of those people when i when it's said and done people will be like oh yeah that guy was really good and they'll be digging up all my old promos and be like well how come this guy never got you know a bigger thing but i try to have that character aspect i really want you to hate my guts but then when i if i have to if i have to go in the ring i remember i saw a tweet somebody was like i really want well, he'd go back to impact and this fan was like, Oh, I never really liked what he did in the ring. What I did in the ring is minuscule co to compared to what I could do in the ring. Because when I would go out there, they would tell me, you don't, we don't want to see you out wrestle the baby. We don't want to see you. You get heat by doing what you do. Go out there and be the cowardly chicken shit heel that you are to get your heat. So that's exactly what I would go do. Um, if you see any of my, a lot of my indie matches, it's kind of the opposite where I'm trying to wrestle and put on banger matches because I like to do that as well. So, you know, let's kind of take a look at some of the stuff you've done. You, you mentioned some fast paced offense. 
and at one point you were the X Division champion. Uh, before we dive into it, what was it like getting that call when they were like, okay, Rohit, you're the guy now. We're going to put the X Division title on you. You're going to be the champ, face of the division. What was it like getting that call? I thought it was a rib. Really? When I when I got my uh, yeah, I thought it was a rib because I was eating crap there forever, and I wouldn't even use the name Rohit Raju on the Indies because it had no value. And I, I remember I told uh, management there one time they're like, "How come we don't use Rohit on the Indies?" I said, "Because it doesn't mean anything. I don't do anything here, but job over and over again. You guys don't put any um, anything behind me." I said, "No one wants to see Rohit Raju on a show." Because they don't even want to see Rohit Raju on Impact. I said, because they already know what's going to happen. And, you know, I, and I still played good soldier. And I started to just, I started to stop worrying about what they wanted and going out there to have fun. And that's when my best stuff happened. And then right before COVID, they pulled me aside and said, hey, we're going to start focusing on you and we're going to switch it up. We're going to take you out of the hit squad and kind of have you do your own thing. And then COVID happened. And then I remember I started eating crap again. And I remember I had that match where I tagged with Moose and they were like literally in the, in the, they were just burying me in the promo. I was like, what the hell? They're like, yeah, I see he's bottom of the barrel and stuff like this. I was like, what? I was getting so mad. And then the next set of tapings, I got the info. They're like, yeah, you're going to, you're teaming up with Chris Bay. You're going to kind of be his lackey, but you're going to win the exhibition championship from him. You're going to swerve him out finesse the ultimate finesser and i was like this is a joke and i literally did not believe it until the match was over and i won and i remember that feeling and to this day i have goosebumps thinking about it now is one of the best feelings because it's one of those things where hard work paid off and they noticed the hard work and it felt so good and what it felt even better is that nobody expected me to do anything with that belt. And so many people thought I had one of the most entertaining runs of that time. And I totally flipped my character. I, I finally became me. I started wearing the really flashy, ugly shirts. And they gave me promo time, the Defeat Rohit Challenge. And they said, hey, I remember when they first started, they started giving me bullet points on what they, want, what they wanted me to say. And then after two promos on a cut, they're like, okay, go say what you want. And that felt so good because they had that faith and confidence in me. And my X Division run was by far one of my favorite things I've ever done in pro wrestling. It felt great. Felt great being the face of that division. And honestly, I wish I could have done it in front of a crowd because I know the heat I would have got would have been amazing. During that time, from that 2020 stretch into 2021, that X division stole the show multiple times throughout those pay-per-views. There were two matches specifically that really drew my eye when I was doing my due diligence. One was, it was the triple threat match with you and Chris Bay. My question for Bay is what was it like having a chance to work with him and then be able to be just so successful building that program between the two of you have it. Cause you guys obviously have chemistry in the ring, watching you work together as a tag team or as singles competitors. How was it being able to build such an intricate story around the X division title with somebody like a Chris Bay? I love Chris Bay. I miss Chris Bay. We, we tax each other here and there. And um, I'm so proud of him and Ace of their work with Bullet Club because those are two guys that I think not only are the future, are they the future of impact, but I think they're the future of professional wrestling. And Chris is so talented. And there is an instant charisma. There's a charisma with our backstage antics because our promos were so funny together and so fun and so easy to do. And then our in-ring stuff, we had one singles match together and it was right after the Ultimate X when we first finally started having crowds again. And it was great. It was one of my favorite matches. It felt so good. And I hope we meet up in the ring again. And I hope um, we have some more backstage segments, at, you know, somewhere. So, but we can't leave out TJ. TJ was a vital part of that. And TJ gave me his mentorship and him kind of taking me under his wing it gave me such confidence because I was really not, I was at a low point and then my X division run helped me out a lot, but he helped me out a lot. And then the more I worked with him, 
the more he trusted me, the more I started calling the matches. And he, it, it just working with those two guys really helped elevate my game, helped elevate my confidence and it bring out, it made me into a better performer. So both TJ and Chris, I have to thank for that because they pulled something out of me that I knew was there, but I thought I had lost that. And they reminded me of who I, who I was and who I can be. And they pulled that out and, yeah, I had nothing but love for those guys. Another one that I found on the list, and this one was one of those stole the night moments, and uh, that was the Ultimate X Magic Slam anniversary in 2021. Yeah. Um, yeah, I liken it to like a Steamboat Savage. You guys weren't the main that night, but you guys easily went out there, stole the show, and put on the match of the night. If this isn't a question about the guys you were working with, sort of. But when you go into it, did, did you guys have that feeling before y'all walked through the curtain? Did you know that you were about to steal the show? You were going to blow the roof off the place? Did you feel it before you went out there? I don't think we knew, but we knew what our goal was. And we knew we had to deliver. And I remember when they told me I was an Ultimate X, I instantly was thinking, of, oh, what is all these cool high spots I could do? But then I was like, no, why would I do that? Why would he do that? He doesn't want to climb the the X division thing. He wants to cheat and figure out the easiest way. So I had Ross, who's in charge of a lot of stuff there. I had him get me one of those long hooks that you you see at a retail store to take off the T-shirt, uh, you know, the high T-shirts. I started thinking of ideas. Uh, Jordan Grace had powerlifting chalk. So I said, hey, do you got your powerlifting chalk with you? Because all of us would always go to the gym. And she goes, yeah. I said, can I borrow it? And then I found, I was looking up stuff. I wanted one of those things that you put across like on a wire. You ever see like an, a, a, a Ninja Warrior? Yeah. I couldn't find one of those. And I was like, oh, there's a rope. I haven't scaled the rope in forever. So I was practicing throwing the rope over there and then climbing it. And then I remember when we were going over everything, Josh Alexander looks at me. He goes, you know, you're going to be the star of this match, right? I said, well, that's the plan because I knew everybody else was going to have amazing things that they were going to do that I couldn't replicate. You know what I mean? I'm not going to hang from a thing, drop and do a Rana. Like Trey's going to do that. Chris is going to do that. Petey's going to be doing some wild stuff with the Canadian destroyer. Josh is going to be, you know, the glue holding everything together. What do I have to do? And it made me feel so good because I went out there and the crowd was for all of it. And then when I finally had the balls to climb up the thing and jump and grab it and climb across only to get pulled down. And I think Trey hit me with his lightning spiral thing and got put out. It felt so good because I remember reading the reviews of that match and it, everyone loved it. And then what also made me feel good is everyone kept saying, and Rohit stood out in that match. And then I remember Kenny Omega was there they're all watching it backstage and Don walked up to me and he goes, Hey, he goes, good job, kid. He goes, you were the, you were uh, the standout in that match. And it made me feel so good. And yeah, I just felt like, what did I have to do? And I, I, I instantly, cause I look at when I, my, the row heat, I thought of, I, I look at like Yano, like Tori, you know what I mean? Like what, what, what stuff did he do? And I would watch those matches when they would have like the, um, best of cup and, uh, he would tie people up and then, you know, try to count them out and hop in the ring. And I was like, man, I have to do something like that, but even better. And that's why I just started brainstorming. But it was such a special moment because I think we were the first match on the card and it was the first night we had a crowd and the energy of that crowd was just awesome. And it was one of those special moments. And I got to share it with people that we were building up this storyline for a long time without a crowd and everything went off without a hitch. And I was very, very honored to share the ring with such talented athletes. And I loved it. Like I said, when I watched, when I rewatched that match, it was just, again, I was like, Oh yeah, they stole the show. There was no question about it. This is a, this is a fun question for you. You've been to the bright lights. You've been to the big stage slam anniversaries, huge, huge show. Okay, but you've also been to a spot show at a house show in a high school gym or VFW hall. You know, we've seen you you've seen on the road both sides of the the pro wrestling gambit. So I want to know what's your favorite thing about those small spot shows? What's your absolute favorite thing about them? But also, what's your least favorite thing about the slammiversary type big shows? 
I think my least favorite about the Slam Anniversary big shows was not being on them because sometimes it didn't matter where you were on the card or on the roster. You could be, they could be like really pushing you, but you still might do the pre-show. Um, I always wanted to be on the big show. So when I finally got a chance to be on the big show, it felt good. And you, you have a special feeling of belonging, you know, you, it really makes you feel a part of the team and a part of the roster, even though you are, but doing something like that gives you that value. You feel valued because they're, they're putting you on a pay-per-view. So that always made me feel really good being a part of those, not being a part. I hated it. Um, something I love about just house shows, indie shows is when you get a good indie show. When I first started out, there was a show called UWA and it was in my hometown and we just did it out of a, you know, Knights of Columbus hall. And that crowd was so loyal and there was always like a hundred, 200, even if there was 50, it was so packed in there, but they were always hot. And now there's a show in Missouri, St. Louis, Glory Pro, which is one of the best indies out there. And they're the same thing. They know everybody. They react. And from beginning to end, they're hot. And I love doing shows like that because you could have a show the day before, drive another eight hours, and then you're like, man, I'm so tired. But once you get out there and that you feel the energy of that crowd, it could just be 100 people. If they're you know, booing you out of the building – because you drew that heat or they're cheering this baby face. My God, that's such a good feeling. And then when you start just everything, you're reacting to everything. It feels so good. And uh, I love that. And I'll always, I remember when I would watch shows, like I used to do those bingo halls. Hell yeah, man. Because that's like grassroots right there. And that's where you get to try new stuff. Does this work? Does that not work? And to me, that is, a real love of professional wrestling. And I love, I love doing those shows, man. So you mentioned some of the stuff you've been up to in the here and now glory pro uh, hustle and muscle being in the freelance tag team scene over there. Um, but when you go from territory to territory, cause I still live in my brain, like the, the indie wrestling scene is divided up into the territories. When you go from territory to territory, do you see a huge difference in the crowds? Do you feel like the crowds expect something different from place to place? Yes. A lot of times you go into these crowds. I did a show. It was hybrid. I think it was a hybrid championship wrestling. It was in Terre Haute, Indiana. And this crowd was, I remember watching in the match I had called, it was myself and Matt Brannigan. And we're like, okay, yeah, we'll do like kind of the ha-ha stuff at first. And we'll start doing all these cool things. And as I was watching the show, I was like, scratch that. Take out these high spots. Let's add this spot with the ref instead. So I go out there and I kind of flip the script and I do more character work than anything. And that got us over. And then doing the thing with the ref at the end got the match more over because they just wanted to watch entertaining professional wrestling. That's all they wanted to watch. They didn't, they didn't need all the cool like super kicks and all that stuff. They didn't need that stuff. But then sometimes when I would work at like AAW, they do want to see that. They want to see that fast pace catches catch can action um high spots yes mixed with the character work but they want to see that intensity and those really cool near falls and all that type of stuff that's what they wanted to see that's what they're reacting on they want to see how good of a professional wrestler athlete athletic wise and character wise can you be and so you just kind of have to pay attention if you're not first look at the crowd ask around like hey what do they like to see and if you're in the ring and something's not working, you got to just do it on the fly and see what works. And, you know, you might have to switch your style up a little bit. So you just got to kind of pay attention to the crowd because there's a lot of places, Lima, Ohio, when I used to do war wrestling, that was a very old school crowd. It was like old NWA crowd where they just want to be entertained. They just want to cheer the good guys and boo the bad guys. So one of those places, you've had a chance to work all over, like I said. Uh, one of those places was at OVW recently. You had a chance to, to work with Al, Slo Al Snow some. Um, he's one of those staples. I've had a chance to interview him. He's a great mind for the business. What was it like crossing paths with Al at OVW? Uh, OVW was a while back where I worked there. Um, Al was cool, though. 
I like when we would, when I was at Impact, we would kind of travel there and do stuff here and there with them. Uh, I did a show for David Hero. Um, man, I forgot the name of the show, and I feel so bad. Uh, man, but it was out there in, man, was it Wisconsin? And David Hero was a great promoter. It was myself and Jake something going against EC3 and Braun Strowman when Braun had his first indie match. And I think Al was out there. And so, but Al, he's cool, man. He's, he's very, he'll tell you like it is. He'll tell you exactly what he's thinking. And, uh, but that scene in Kentucky was nice. I recently did something with Derby City, which was in Kentucky. And that should be airing soon. That's a great show. They have an awesome setup. It looks like it should be on tv so but i i really enjoyed working out there but obw was cool one of my old buddies he used to train out there joe coleman but he trained i think he trained in the same class as like um or maybe when they just left before they left when it was like cena and batista and all those guys but um yeah it, it was cool al's al's cool still jacked to this day which is really awesome to see this has become my favorite question to ask everybody and because it's one of those things that's very similar to the origin story, I'm going to ask a similar question and I get a very different answer from person to person. So if you go back to day one, match one, night one, and you look at rookie Rohit and you say, okay, this is the advice I'm going to give you. What advice do you give that man today? Slow down. The Everything else was, to my knowledge that I remember, was fine. But that adrenaline rush, having my first match, those nerves, slow down. Because I'm naturally quick. And when I first started those first few years, everything's just 100 miles uh, a minute. You know what I mean? And now I've learned to switch gears and then go fast and explosive when need be. But hands down, those first few years, slow down. Because I would always shut my mouth. I would always ask questions when... Uh, you know, for advice and listen to the advice and pay attention to what was going on and do all those steps they tell you. But um, just slowing down was one of the main things. And I've always been very humble. Uh, and at least I've tried to, unlike the character. But um, yeah, just ease up, slow down. All right. Well, I always close them the same way too. And it's with five random. I got yours ready. You're good to go. All right. Question number one. Would you rather never get hungry again or thirsty again? Ooh. Tough questions. That is a tough question because my mind gets all science-y. And I'm like, well, if I don't drink, I'll get dehydrated. But then if I don't eat, I won't get my gains. I guess I would rather not get thirsty because with food, I think I could. Ah, here's the, here's the thing, though. Could I? liquefy my food and drink it that way see you start breaking it down i'd rather eat i would just rather eat i'm a, you know i was a chef for 15 years i think i could go without water if i was able to stay hydrated but giving right. foods just one of those things i don't think i could stop eating same i don't think i could question number two what's your favorite venue you've ever had a chance to wrestle in Ooh, man, I'd have to say Vegas was always fun doing the shows out there. ECW Arena was really cool. Uh, Orlando at the first Ring of Honor tapings, that was pretty sweet for AEW's Ring of Honor. And um, that was at Universal. <laughs> man, there is a there is a place... Again, it was it was uh, and I can't think of the name of that promotion. This is David Hero's promotion, but it was their big show when we did the tag match, and it whatever that venue was, that venue was amazing. If anyone, if you're looking at this, you just look it up. It was when Jake something and I, uh, like I said, wrestled EC3 and Braun Strowman. That it was like a small like arena, and it was awesome. And that place was packed, and that crowd was hot, and I think that might be one of my favorite spots. I love a good venue that makes a crowd seem just ridiculously hot. Like yes. if the venue can make a crowd sound bigger than what it is, those are my favorite venues sometimes versus seeing a big arena show. Yeah, wrestling with no crowd during COVID was rough at first because you feed off that energy. I've always wondered how – I've asked a few times about it, like how, how tough it was to adjust. Yeah, it, was, it took a minute. Question number three, what was your favorite childhood cartoon? 
Oh, Lord. My favorite cartoon of all time is The Simpsons. Childhood cartoon? Man. Probably Transformers or G.I. Joe. Solid picks. Yeah, I have something in my eye. It's really bothering me. That's really annoying. <laughs> I had to mute for but a no, second. Transformers my dogs were going nuts. Huh? I said I had to mute for a second. My dogs were going nuts. They started losing their <laughs> I, minds downstairs. <laughs> mine will do that, too. You'll just hear them barking in the background, going all crazy. Or if I have them outside, you'll hear them because I have my window open. But, yeah, Transformers, I loved cartoons. I still watch cartoons. But I think as a kid, Transformers or G.I. Joe were the ones my go-to all the time. Question number four. What's your favorite vacation spot? I'd say Las Vegas. Great city. Las yes. Vegas. So much fun. All right. Question number five. I'm going to ask. Do you think a hot dog is a sandwich? No. No? Just flat? No, it's just not a sandwich? No, because it folds. And it doesn't. It's not two pieces of, like together that are separated. It folds like a pe like pita bread. Okay. I've heard somebody recently told me that a hot dog is in the same family as a taco, and it blew my mind for a second. I can see that, but it's not because one's a shell, and the other one's still a tortilla, and one's still just bread. So, uh, I don't know. Bun. But I guess. They, but it, uh, same same thing. I can see that. It goes AWOL <laughs> after we start asking these random ones. It gets crazy. Um, but yeah. this is everybody's favorite part of the interview because I shut up. Um, I tell you to plug your stuff, put yourself over, tell everybody where your socials are, what you have coming, um, anything exciting, just uh, put yourself over for everybody. ProWrestlingTees.com slash Rohit. You can find some merch on there. Of course, you can catch me on Twitter. That's at Hakeem Zane um, on Twitter. That's H-A-K-I-M Raju Zane 80 on the old Instagram. And let me see. We have a Patreon, my Rohit Ro Raju Patreon, lifting weights, backstage stuff. Uh, I just started doing, I want to start doing, like, uh, I'm trying to build up my YouTube channel. I just saw Across the Spider-Verse, so I'm going to be dropping a, um, a review for that, which was, it was an excellent movie, but I'm going to drop a review for that. I just got to be consistent with it. And that's about it at the moment. I have... Glory Pro at the end of the month. I'm actually headed out to Columbus, Ohio to say hello, over, uh, hello to everybody at the Impact pay-per-view just to catch up with people. And uh, who knows? I'm maybe trying to get some – get back in there. We'll see. But um, – and then I got Windsor next month. There's a local show for a fundraiser I'm also doing. Of course, Glory Pro and Derby City. That taping should be airing soon. Pay attention to my social medias. I will be posting more as soon as I get more information. And it is myself versus another former X Division champion, Jake Chris. And I can, spoiler alert, the match is fire. Love me some Jake Chris. That kid can work, man. Good dude. Really yeah. good dude. He's alumni of the show as well. Fantastic. Oh, sweet. Oh, yeah. That's what's up. Uh, well, Rohit, man, I really appreciate you taking some time on your Tuesday and chatting about some wrestling with me, brother. Yeah, man, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for I'm finally glad we could figure out a time and make it work. I, I, it's one of those things. I told you, I'm really easy. I understand. Life comes hard, especially in the world of pro wrestling sometimes. Like, I get right. it. <laughs> so, for Rohit Raju, I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people.